Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm excited. It seems like there's more alumni here than students, uh, people that I have not seen for a very long time. And I've, uh, I've been waiting for a chance to kind of uh, get, get together. Uh, I saw John once, and Nadia I visited in France, Jay and I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, so it's, it's nice to see everybody, everybody here. And of course, I, when I can, when uh, a situation allows, I really like visiting HKUSD, uh, seeing the people that I uh, care about and I uh, um, studied and worked with for a very long time. Plus, it's a gorgeous campus. So it's, it's always nice to see. Uh, to see that view. Um, and today I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, share with you a little bit of what we've been doing. Uh, we, as uh, you know, some of the people who are here together with me, so Jane and, and uh, John, and also Prasad and Donna, who are not here, uh, join me on this, uh, on this journey. So I would like to look at this as kind of a joint achievement of a large group of people who are typically uh, ignored. Um, early career researchers and students, I think, are often uh, overlooked, and especially uh, this open science uh, movement collaborative work um, is, is, making, is making a difference. And I don't think coming into this that I realized how strong of an impact this is going to have. Uh, I was worried about all sorts of steps that I did along the way. But now it seems like it has matured to the point where I really feel very comfortable to uh, come talk to you, invite students as early as undergraduates. But of course, uh, in M uh, management at HKUST, I invite the, the master's and the PhD students to join us uh, in this journey. And also the early career researchers uh, that just uh, you know joined recently uh, that the management is faculty so it's nice to see the new names that are coming in um, and it's it's some exciting stuff uh, in organizational behavior and some judgment decision making for folks so it's uh, it's nice to see uh, that the mgmt family uh, grow i'm uh, gonna begin with a little bit of background and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey. I have some warnings uh, to, to come. I'll just you know, say that uh, if you want the longer version of this talk, uh, everything that I do on Zoom, uh, which has been going on for a couple of semesters now, is on YouTube and also this uh, talk is going to be uh, recorded. So speaker mode, I'm going to be <laughs> presenting myself and uploading this to YouTube afterwards. Uh, if you speak out, you'll also be recorded and I can remove this afterwards if you want. Just know that this is, that this is happening and that if you miss out on something, you can go and, uh, and have a look at this uh, later on. Also, the, the slides are here. You can download the slides. They're gonna keep appearing over here, the URL on the bottom right. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen well. Uh, if not, let me know. Um, so um, also we have open science talks. Uh, you can all go, go and have a look at those. Uh, I, so the warning that I wanted to give you is that some of the stuff that I'm going to be uh, talking about is uh, controversial. Uh, like Alex said, uh, open science movement is undergoing the, the, the credibility revolution is, is ongoing right now. So uh, I know that uh, a lot of people tend to have strong reactions to some of the things that I, that I uh, raise. So I just wanna say, please be patient with me. Um, I'll be happy to answer everything that you might wanna ask. I just uh, ask that you wait with this. Just let me go through the, the entire thing and then uh, you're welcome to write things on the chat and I'll try and address everything towards the end, there's just like a narrative, I think that we should go through, first of all, what the situation is, and then what we decided to do about this. Uh, so feel free to, to ask questions, but please be patient that I'll, I'll address this uh, afterwards, towards the end. The main point that I'll, the, the, the whole purpose of this project and most of the things that I'm dedicated to, dedicated to in the last, uh, four years or so, is uh, that we need a credibility revolution. Uh, there's this term, replication reprodu reproducibility crisis, that people have been using to um, 
talk about what's been happening in the last uh, decade or so. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, my main messages is that we need open science. We have to improve the way that we do research. We have to work uh, in a collaboration. So I think uh, I was raised at the management department at HKUST mostly uh, to work on my own or work with a mentor or work with one advisor. Uh, very rarely that we had a few students working uh, together. Very rarely did we reach out outside um, the, the, the department, maybe when we had an exchange. But really working in collaboration, doing a lot of projects together is something that we, uh, we were not trained uh, to do and we need to do a lot more about. And I'm going to show you just how far we can go with this. And when I say uh, collaboration, it's not just with senior scholars who have a lot of experience. Actually, it means... Um, moving away from working with the senior scholars and focusing on early career researchers and students. So I started working with uh, undergraduates as early as second year. They are my uh, co-authors. Uh, they are the ones who are doing research and, and publishing with me. And I wanna show you how we're doing this. So the main message, if you're a student, if you're an early career researcher is that you can make a difference. Uh, it's not up to the environment or the system only. Uh, they have a role to play, but it's, uh, there's a lot in there uh, that you can contribute to all of that. I want to start uh, very quickly, briefly, uh, with this uh, piece of advice uh, that I saw posted in a very famous uh, blog in 2016. And, and this is a blog that was dedicated to a career advice on how to do well in academia. Um, and this is the name of the post was the grad student who never said no. So this very well published uh, researcher in, in the field who wrote this healthier and happier blog said that he uh, had a data set. I, uh, um, this data set cost us a lot of time and our own money to collect. There's got to be something here that we can salvage because it's really cool. So this uh, uh, senior researcher went to the postdoc and said to the postdoc, uh, you have to make uh, use of this because it's a wonderful data set, even though I didn't uh, you know, find what it is that we wanted to find, you can find something. And the postdoc said no. Um, so instead he went to a PhD student, a visiting PhD student from a Turkish university. And every day they looked at new results and new analysis and they would scratch their heads and ask why, and then come up with another way to reanalyze the data and then uh, plausible hypothesis. And finally the advice that uh, the person wrote on the blog, which was considered very, very good advice, is that be like the Turkish woman, don't be like the postdoc. If somebody comes to you with a data set and says you can find something in there, uh, you should uh, do this. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know a lot of PhD students who uh, did this as a career, um, but the problem is, is that this is a Brian uh, Wanzink, uh, who by now has been uh, outcasted and fired from Cornell. And I think half of his papers have been retracted so far. And you can see the headlines. It's a very unfortunate story about once uh, he wrote this blog, people said, really, this is how you do research? Uh, and they started digging into his papers and realizing that he did a lot of things that um, are at the very least are questionable research practices slash fee hacking, but even go beyond that with all sorts of other uh, issues. So I want to start by saying, this is not science. Please don't do this. <laughs> Uh, I did not realize, uh, I think throughout my early uh, career years, that this is a problem. But now we understand a little bit more that, that this is a problem. Um, and I want to talk, uh, you know, before we, we dive in, uh, a case study uh, from management. So I want to talk about the things that are going on in management. I occasionally go, I don't read a lot of management literature recently. But I decided for this talk, I'm going to look at a uh, journal of applied psychology and AMJ and see. So what's happening with the field since I left management and moved to social psychology? What is happening? So here's a paper, a random paper that I got from uh, top tier journal of applied psychology in 2020. Um, and what you can see here that you have two lab studies and one field study. So very rigorous um, from the abstract, it looks very promising, and I like it that there's a laboratory experiment. And then this is what the methods are. So I just like copy pasted this for you and highlighted things. So in uh, study one, in the year 2020, the first study was 55 students uh, between subject design. Study three was 80 students, bigger sample, 40 in each condition. 
And then the p values, I don't know why APA style is supposed to be exact three decimal point, but they only say p value lower than 0 0.05. If you calculate yourself what the mean standard deviation, what the effect size is, and what the p values are, it's just below 0 0.05 for both of these studies. We now know, at least in uh, most of the psychology journals, social psychology journals, uh, that I um, try and, and submit to or in the work that I do is that there, there's some issues in the way that we uh, do this. I'm, I don't mean to specifically look at, uh, you know, these researchers or that topic. I'm just saying as a field, if this is the, the, the evidence, we should be very humble about this kind of evidence. What is the problem with this, with this evidence? Is that there's very, very low power. Now we know how to calculate these sort of things. Uh, we know how to do a sensitivity analysis. So if you have 28 uh, in each condition, uh, you can detect an effect size of about coins D of one, uh, 0.98, which is an unreasonably large effect, which means this is a very, very underpowered uh, sample. Plus, if you read the paper, there's no exact reporting, there's no raw descriptives, there's no effect size confidence intervals. Of course, there's no pre-registration no data code uh, sharing and no disclosures about how many did you run? Did you exclude anything? Did you include anything? And now we have all kinds of tools like this shiny app that I took over here is that if we have a very low power, in this case, I put the power that was in the paper, which is actually lower than 0 0.35, you'll see that the chances of you having a two out of two significant findings when the power is this low is lower than 12%, which means that there's probably a file drawer of a lot of studies that were ran uh, here, but are not included, unless, of course, it could be that it's part of the 12%. 12 in addition, in the method, uh, you know, the study too, that is a field study, we see this kind of HLM analysis uh, where we see a lot of, you know, first of all, you control for which organization, which is okay, but then you have all sorts of control variables. The thing is, is that there's a little bit of a note saying that this is the same data set as an earlier study. If you look at the earlier study, you see different kinds of covariates. So which covariates to include? What uh, covariates are relevant? Why is this more relevant than other things that were in the other study? I don't know. But finally, if you include a lot of covariates, then you get to a p-value lower than 0 0.05 exactly for the uh, interaction that you uh, anticipated. Then finally, you have three studies that kind of say the same story. Uh, this is to say that there's very flexible uh, selective overuse of covariates from a very large data set that has a lot of other different measures. And once again, the p-values are just under 0 0.05 when there's no pre-registration, there's no data code sharing, and there's no disclosure about how did you decide about what covariates? And now we know that these are uh, problematic. We've known this for over a decade now, but there's all sorts of issues in both of these uh, things, both the field and the, uh, and the experiment. Uh, Katie, uh, a quick question here. I haven't yes. read that paper yet. Uh, now for the control variables, right? Uh, the, the practice these days is that uh, you need to justify why these variables are relevant uh, theoretically, right? Why, why they're important control. And also, uh, it's become a common practice that you also need to report uh, your results without those controls. What, what do your hypothesis actually hold? So I don't know whether they did this. If they did this, then uh, for the control part, I think it should be okay if they justified why these are relevant to control and whether results hold without those controls. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to like especially fall on this case study. It, it, it's just you know you can go in and, and read the paper, uh, but even even with that, there's all sorts of issues uh, in terms of did you decide about the justifications uh, before, after? So pre-registration for one is supposed to at least let you address this in advance before you looked at the data, before you did your analysis. But this is just one part of a large number of issues that could be addressed if we had transparency. If you have both these things and lack of transparency, it all remains a measure of trust. You know, uh, It could be that this trust is warranted, but we'll come to a point where I'm gonna show you that we have an issue with replications where it, you know, it, it's not even something that people are doing consciously. It could be something that we thought this is best practices and it, now we know that it's not, 
or we convinced ourselves that this is the right story to tell. So I'm not trying to judge an entire uh, literature. We all did this at some point, you know, up until 2011 when we realized this is an issue, but now we know better and we know how important it is to be uh, transparent. It's also very, very important that given this kind of evidence under powered samples, use of a lot of covariates is that we need at the very least to repeat this again, because this is more of exploratory and we need to do conformatory. Uh, plus we need to report just as we found something, we need to report all the things that we did not find, all the null findings. And we need a lot of humility when we discuss this uh, sort of things. Before we jump ahead and say implications for managers, this is what you should do. Let's take this slow. Let's build this step by step. Let's be humble about what we do. And after we have an accumulation of evidence, rigorous, well-powered studies, pre-registered, you know, meta-analyzed, hopefully register reports and so forth, and we'll talk about that, then we can go in into practical uh, implications. So think about instead of servant leadership, think about if this was a COVID uh, uh, study, will you take a vaccine based on this kind of, of study? Uh, I would not even if they disclosed how they chose their covariates. So we need an accumulation, we need humility, we need to do science rigorously, and now we know how to do this better than what we uh, used to do. But I think this was a kind of reflection of my PhD journey of, of the papers that I used to read, which has a lot to do with theory. You know, you justify things theoretically, you build theory, uh, but then there's very, very little about the results. And it doesn't really say anything. First of all, a lot of people don't share the materials. It's about a specific context with small samples. And there's, again, this massive discussion about 10, 20 papers, uh, uh, pages of, of advancing theory, practical implications based on, on very brief uh, methods and, and results. So to me, this is not, did not feel uh, like science. And we all have all these sort of issues like, moderation, mediation, multi-levels, errors going in all kinds of direction, three-way, four-way, uh, very underpowered studies. Well, now we know that if you need a two-by-two two interaction, you need very, very well-powered studies, and we never take this into consideration. If you add a moderation, you need to take this into consideration with the power. You do a mediation, you need to take this into consideration. We, we don't do this, and we need transparency about how we use covariates, how we exclude things, uh, how we did the procedures, how did we decide, why is this stimuli, and of course, all the null findings, not just the things uh, that worked. So to me, uh, the literature in management felt more of an art than, than uh, science, and you know, this obsession with theoretical contribution and, and the gap seemed uh, you know, mis misplaced when the evidence is not emphasized. And then there's all sorts of other, what we now call questionable research practices about all sorts of other things that, that are, are happening. Now, I'm going to just show you that I'm not the person claiming this, it's the literature in management that's claiming this. So you've got the editor of Leadership Quarterly calling these diseases, <laughs> significocosis <laughs> or new, neophilia, uh, the theoria, uh, you know, all these kinds of things about the things that we, do in the management literature that we now know are a disease and are causing all sorts of problems with a literature that is not reliable and that we need to, to verify uh, again and again. Just as a summary slide for the OB literature, I don't want to spend too much time uh, on this sort of thing, but to me, this is just from now, it's 2021, this is from the last few weeks about a summary of the open science practices in the top journals, AMJ, JAP, OBHDP, Org Science. How many of them do open materials? OB, OBHDP is climbing. Now it's getting close to 25%. JAP, AMJ, close to nothing. Open data, close to nothing. Pre-registration, close to nothing. <laughs> Reporting of null results. How can everything be significant all, all the time? Zero, it's, just, it's on zero. Replications, close to zero. Is this sustainable? Is this what we expect of a science? It's not what I expect of a science. So to me, this is very troubling uh, evidence. And this is in line with some of the things that were happening in social psychology back in the, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago. Uh, social psychology is not perfect. I'm gonna talk about social psychology in a few slides, uh, but there are uh, trends that are happening right now. And this project that I'm uh, presenting is part, part of this uh, trend. Uh, Philly. Share yeah. with you one piece of information. Actually, for P-Psych, for P-Psych, it was not the practice before. Uh, 
uh, now you actually need to, after the paper is accepted, you need to actually uh, share your entire, basically all the syntax analysis and uh, related to any results, including the uh, uh, any supplementary analysis, right? The results which is not reporting the paper. So any of those, all the original syntax that you need to send to, uh, to the journal. So we, we just got uh, one paper accepted last year and eventually send seven, more than 70 pages, right? More than 70 pages of all those uh, syntax and uh, output from the data set uh, associated with that paper. Anyway, so that's just a, uh, uh, the, the, a new practice from, from one of those uh, uh, OBHR journals. Yes, uh, so I really hope that this is, this is going to become uh, mainstream. Uh, so data sharing, transparency, code, all of that uh, need, needs to happen. Hopefully more pre-registrations or register reports, uh, which is kind of like where science, where science is going. So a lot of things that we can do in order to improve. And I'm, hap I'm happy to see that some of the journals, so Leadership Quarterly is one of them, uh, perhaps PSYC is now following in, in that path. That, that embrace these and there's increasing recognition that we have to we have to address this and these are some of the you know from, from the management literature some of the things that I found very quick uh, search about some of the things that are happening uh, in the field one more thing I want to do before I go into the project is another uh, case study uh, actually it's a case study of uh, a submission that I had with GA in <laughs> So uh, this was my last submission to a management journal. And after this, I said, uh, uh, no, no more of this until I see some signs. I really thought that OBHDP with a new editorial, some of them I know, uh, these editors. Um, so now they changed again, but this was Francesca Gino and she brought a few other people. Some of them uh, are supportive of open science. So I thought I'm going to uh, submit to OBHDP and hope for the best. Um, this is something I saw on Twitter uh, yesterday, and it really <laughs> reminded me of this of this uh, um, experience that I had, the last experience I had with OBHDP. So this is in the marketing journal. So somebody from yesterday, this is March 10, 2021. We just received reviews from round two submission to a top marketing journal recommendations of the seven studies. One is retain, one replace, one drop, one rerun. <laughs> Questionable. <laughs> Another one is rerun. And then an, another person from, from marketing uh, who, you know, we follow each other on Twitter. This is very disturbing. And this is, it's amazing that this is happening in 2021. Don't we know, uh, haven't we learned anything from what's been happening in the last uh, 10 years? And this is co common practice in, in a lot of top, top tier journals uh, in management. Unfortunately, it's also common in, let's say, JPSP up, till, uh, up to not too long ago. JPSP was famous for this. So across the fields, top tier management uh, and psychology journals do all these kinds of things, but this is not, and we need to understand, this is not okay. And this is not science. And we need to push back on this. Uh, this is my uh, rejection from all the HDP, uh, all sorts of things about, you know, theory construction and contribution. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the so what in your paper? Uh, three reviewers, a lot of subjective. I feel that this is not important enough. I think that this is uh, uh, that. I don't understand that. The, so what? What is important? What is important from a theoretical standpoint? But it had four pre-registered studies with consistent effects over a new phenomena. But they were uh, con considering theoretical contribution and so what. And then asking me for three more studies over the, uh, the four that I already conducted, just so I they can address all sorts of things regarding, you know, practical uh, implications. And after this, you know, the, the, the decision editor said, maybe after you run this, you'll, you'll submit this and I'll decide if I'm going to accept this or not. Uh, and what I said is, if I understand correctly, you're asking me for three more studies. Uh, even though I have four pre-registered studies demonstrating a consistent, reliable phenomena based on what is common in the, the judgment decision-making literature, I don't understand. Therefore, I don't see a clear path over here. Thank you very much. Even though this is a, a request for revision, I'm declining to uh, revise this with the uh, kind help of GAN. Uh, we submitted this to JSP and pending minor uh, revisions, this was published. And now you can go and you can see this 
I, I think you know you can even have a look at all the data. Everything is uh, shared on Open Science Framework. It's not that the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology is better than OBHDP in, let's say, the, the kind of evidence that it provides, but the emphasis, how they treat, uh, you know, the emphasis on uh, empirics rather than, than theory. How do you just throw away four studies, three registered studies showing a, a consistent effect of phenomena? I just, uh, to me, this was a baffling sort of, of experience. I did not know what to do with this which led me to my journey that started in Maastricht University. I understood that there's some, some kind of a problem and we need to address this. Um, and the biggest shock to me came, I think in 2015, 2016, when we realized that we have uh, some issues with replication. So we have known for over a decade that there are all sorts of things that you know, we're doing that are uh, not exactly science uh, and questionable research practices, plus pu publication bias and all sorts of gatekeepers, uh, only publishing positive results and, and, and stuff like that. So we started as a community in social psychology to do mass replications. And then we realized that a lot of these things don't replicate very well. And if you, uh, you know, if you, you were with me at HKUSD, you know that during my uh, PhD, I did an exchange to Florida State University where I work with a, a lab uh, that uh, is very famous for one of the things that they're famous for is ego depletion. So for me, I was very interested in does ego depletion uh, replicate or not. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that uh, you know, we found in the last decade have to do with ego depletion. One of the strongest findings in social psychology, you know, hundreds of papers, thousands of citations, doesn't seem to replicate even when in the second mass col uh, collaboration um, to try and replicate these effects, the original authors, Kathleen Voss and, and, and Baumeister failed to find support for ego depletion. People have been publishing on this for decades. So what, what does it mean that all of these things fail to replicate? And then we had all these mass collaborations coming out and, and Brian Osek here from the Center of Open Science uh, summarizes many labs one, many labs two, many labs three, all of these together, the replication rate is about uh, half. And we're talking about the top journal, psychological science, uh, JPSP, um, you know, this top of the field, very reputable, uh, the replication rate is about half. And in these half, the effect size seems to be about half of what was uh, published before that. Some people said maybe in nature science, if it was published in nature and science, it will replicate better. It did not, 13 out of 21, and the effect sizes are still about half of the original. So, um, and, and since then we've been doing a lot of mass replications. And, and this is from the last uh, two, three years, mass collaborations, a lot of labs from around the world trying to um, to replicate things like priming and uh, commitment priming, honesty priming, hostility priming, death priming, embodiment, all sorts of things that don't replicate. Um, and, now, and now we need to, to decide what to do with this. If you open any social psychology uh, book, you know, it's, it's filled with these with this findings. So what do we do with this? How do we communicate this to our students, to our colleagues, to practitioners, to people in the field? What do we do with this kind of uh, situation? If we try to summarize this, the situation in social psychology, uh, which we see is very disappointing, uh, a clear uh, signal of, of uh, you know, something is wrong and we need to address this, is the replication rate is somewhere between 30 to 50%. And in what replicates, it seems like the effect size of what was published is about half of, of the original. At the beginning, people said this is psychology. Uh, it's not related to anything else, but since 2015 in a science paper that, that came out as a mass collaboration, they've started to do this in other fields. And now we realize this is a science problem. This is not related to management. This is not related to social psychology. This is how we've been doing uh, science. So in medicine, the science has stopped working in chemical research, in economics, in cancer research. So now if something doesn't work in management, or in psychology, okay, um, it, you know, some, some, some disappointment, but perhaps not as much harm done as if cancer research is broken, then people, people die, people get hurt. So we really need to uh, stop and think for a second, what does this mean? 
is, is there a problem? What is the problem? What can we do in order to address this sort of thing? This is recently from August 2020, threats of replication crisis in empirical computer science. Empirical computer science. It's a clo as close to math as, as we can get in, in, this, in this sort of thing, Al algorithms. And, and so if we can't reproduce, if you can replicate the stuff over there, then, then something is very wrong in the way that we've been doing research. What are the rates in the hard sciences uh, that we're supposed to do so much better than social psychology and management? We don't have a lot of data. So all of this is initial, but you can see the rates here. Very, very disappointing. The most rigorous one going on right now is this cancer biology uh, one, which is very disappointing. In 32 out of the 50, they couldn't even begin the replication because they couldn't reproduce the materials. And out of the 18, they've done 14 so far and only nine of them, they were able to replicate. And then again, with effect sizes, uh, you know, much weaker than the original. Cancer, cancer biology. We're not talking psychology and management anymore. And neuroscience, a lot of issues over there, very small samples, uh, a lot of noise. So uh, the little that we have on that is, is very low. So you can click on any of these and see the rates for yourself. And, and typically when I present this, and I've presented this a lot in the past uh, two, three years, I, you know, when the world was open, I was going around the world and trying to talk to people about these, these issues. A lot of people push back and they try to tell me either that I'm wrong or that I'm over, uh, you know, I'm exaggerating or that uh, what I'm doing is, is perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm scaring people and there's no reason for that. And what I'm trying to say is I'm not... I'm, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not uh, uh, trying to, you know, revolutionize everything from the beginning and say that everything that we've done is wrong. What I'm trying to say is we have enough evidence to understand that we need to stop for a second, reflect on what we're doing, reassess what we're doing, and think about ways to improve. And I really like this slide. It was originally for the climate uh, crisis that we have. So somebody talking about energy independence, uh, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, clean water and air. And then somebody yells, you know, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Exactly the same thing with open science and trying to improve and do things, data sharing, reducing publication bias, preventing p-hacking. How could this be anything but good? So somebody come, coming up and said, but what if it's a big hoax and we create a better science for nothing? Let's create a better science, you know, regardless of all these issues. But now we know that it's more urgent, especially during a time of a pandemic. The world is in crisis. There are all sorts of challenges. We really have to push ourselves to do, to do better. So Elik was right. In Maastricht was the first time that I had some time for myself to sit down and think, what do I want my professional career to look like? If I'm going to be an academic, what is it that I should emphasize? And I emphasize trustworthiness, reproducibility, and replicability. And that means that a lot of things that I've been trained on, a lot of pressures that I've received from gatekeepers, journals, editors, reviewers, my collaborators, I need to put all that aside and focus on what I think matters in order to address this kind of crisis. And here you can see, uh, we're talking about changing models. So no more of this moderation, mediation, multi-level million uh, you know, errors going in different directions. Simplicity, sometimes a main effect. Actually, I, I remember like a, 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 a little of a debate in a supermarket I had with Yaping at one point where it's like, ha has all the main effects been discovered and now it's all about uh, you know, interactions? There's lots of main effects that we can still uh, look at and, and we're doing this in, in, all of the, in all of the fields. There's lots of main effects that we can, like, we can still discover. We should emphasize effect sizes. We understand all the problems with p-values. Power is really important. We need to do pre-registrations and move to register reports. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. All the findings are important, not just the, the, the positive ones, but also the null findings. We have to do more replications. We need to share everything as a preprint. Just imagine what would happen if we, in COVID, would wait three years for a paper to be published and for them to ask for four more data collections, uh, three years until we, we, we get one paper out. We need to share things when they happen and we need a way to evaluate these preprints and, and, and understand what is noise and what is signal. But we have to share everything as early as possible and not wait you know, for gatekeepers to, to go through some subjective criteria of what the theory is, is telling us about things like COVID. 
you know, so full transparency, uh, sharing all the materials, sharing the entire process. Uh, and and most important, I think, in this project is working in as, as a community in collaboration with one another, supporting one another, uh, really helping others do better science, not just for yourself. If you're already doing something, offer this as a service uh, to others. And I think the open science community is very much about that, about supporting each other. So this brings me to our um, to, to the project that, that we've been doing. Um, it's really time for us to do a credibility revolution. We have to emphasize uh, credibility, trustworthiness. And there's all sorts of directions that we can take this. And I've been trying to taste a little bit of each of those in order to understand what I can do in order to better my own research, but also to help generally as a community in order to improve um, together, what, not just in psychology and, and management, but also on science overall. So I have these kind of three uh, circles of meta science, open science, collaborative uh, science. And in addition to that, it has to impact the way that we teach, also the way that we commun communicate to, uh, to the public, to the general public, to practitioners. And we have to use every resource that is available. And we have a lot of uh, resources that are underutilized. For example, students, we teach courses, um, we, we work to, with students, very qualified, HKUST, HKU top, of the, the, the students in our region, uh, perhaps in the world. Uh, so so we, we can just treat them as, as passive receivers of information if we think that we have any reliable information, or we can invite them to, to come with us on a journey and help us uh, to address, address this, this uh, crisis, uh, the, the need for this revolution together. So the, the model, uh, that I know from all of my studies, both HKUSD and before that, is that there, you know, the classroom standing in, you know, sitting in front of a, a professor, and telling them the truth is this is the truth: social priming, ego depletion, power posing. Why? Because it's in the book. You know, I've never studied these, but it's in the book. Therefore, I can communicate uh, this to you. But now we know that this is an issue, um, and in, uh, you know, we recently. Uh, I think a month ago, Adam Grant, which I think uh, we all um, respect and, and adore you know, for all sorts of reasons, both as an academic and as a communicator to the general public, came out with a new book, which I strongly recommend. I listened to this as an audio book while I was hiking around Hong Kong, trying to kind of calm down and, and disconnect from, uh, from work a little bit. And I thought it was a really good book for a lot of reasons, but I especially like chapter number nine because this is some of the stuff that I've been trying to do here at, at HKU is that we need to uh, teach differently. We need to teach students to question knowledge, not just receive, you know, I'm the professor, therefore hear my words, this is the truth. No more of that. We need to bestow upon the students a scientist mindset with humility learn by doing rather than by receiving and, and endorsing the confusion, the uncertainty uh, and the messiness that is science. We need to understand that not everything works, not everything you know, that we read can be p-value lower than 0 0.05. Uh, we need to really uh, invite them on a journey for both of us to inform one another. So we share with students what it is that we know, but we ask them to question this. We ask them, what would you do here? What would you, uh, contribute to, for, to, to, to this uh, uh, direction. Uh, so I really recommend this reading, especially chapter number nine. It's very close to what I learned to do in Maastricht. So in Maastricht, they had problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is that there's, there's no, uh, you know, teaching, frontal teaching where, uh, you know, I'm in front of, of the class. I sit in the back. I do not interfere with a group of up to 10 students. And they do everything together. They facilitate one another. I present them with problems. I tell them this is a problem that you need to solve. They decide their learning goals. They decide what resources they want to learn from, perhaps academia. They can read articles. Perhaps they can go on YouTube, Wikipedia. They can read all sorts of resources. And then they integrate this together. They do a discussion and they, they do a project. So everything is learning by doing. So they're much more motivated and much more engaged. Actually, remember something 
uh, afterwards. There are no regular tests with a multiple choice. I'm not quizzing them on something specific that I think is the truth, but they need to uh, arrive at the truth. And the stuff that I've seen come out of uh, uh, Maastricht, this uh, problem-based learning is, is outstanding. And it convinced me that I wanna do something similar here at HKU, not just with uh, thesis students or you know, postgrad or PhD students, I wanna do this with undergraduates, which is why for my courses here at HKU, I set some principles where this is going to be student-led. So the students go out and they seek uh, uh, answers to, to uh, questions. Uh, they do actual science that could become publishable. And we, we uh, show that this can be published and that the project would have real impact. They would go through the scientific process of peer reviewing each other. They would use the latest tools and trends in psychological science, including pre-registrations, power analysis, effect size, confidence intervals, everything that we have right now, they need to, to know state of the art, you know, best practices of our field now, not 10 years ago when things you know, were, not, were not ideal. And then no more books. I don't use any of the social psychology books anymore. I focus on replicable, mass replication, credible, trustworthy findings that have been verified again and again. And then we try and revisit those to assess those. And I'm gonna talk about meta science and assessing uh, what the science is. And, and, and really humility. We as instructors, we as professors need to take a step back and realize that we do not know right now what is going on. We need to go on a journey with them and learn together uh, with them. And we need to do this all in complete transparency. Uh, we need to share everything that we do, uh, including our teaching, including the process of thinking together with the students. And we need to focus on rigor and collaboration rather than you know, all the other things. Uh, novelty is not as important as rigor and accuracy and simplicity tends to uh, do a lot better in terms of credibility than complexity. Although we need to recognize that simplicity does not capture everything and there is room for complexity after we kind of look at a smaller phenomena. If you wanna see what my courses uh, look like, I strongly encourage you, everything is open and shared in the open science framework. So you can go, you can scan this, you can have a look at what the, uh, what the syllabus uh, looks like. It's a 25 to 30 pages syllabus. And uh, in the first two weeks, it's the add drop period here at HKU. Uh, they need to go over the syllabus and they have a quiz on the syllabus because the syllabus, at least in my view, is a contract where we set and align expectations. So I'm telling them, I'm not gonna tell you what the truth is. I'm not going to tell you that this is how things are. There's no, no multiple choice uh, quiz at the end of the course. Uh, we are going on this together and it's going to be complicated. It's going to be messy. It's going to be uncertain. And I need you to be in the same mindset as I am. A lot of people drop and that's completely okay. But those who stay have done the quiz gone through the two weeks and wanted to know more about the current state of science and the ones that are invited to do these projects together uh, with me. And if, uh, everything that I'm doing, everything is, is shared. This is on the open science framework. And because the last semester I also did on Zoom, so now you can see also my lectures on Zoom. And you can see that the first lecture of every course that I give is called Science in Crisis. So it's important that we are you know, straightforward and that we communicate things very clearly to the students. Um, so sometimes I get all kinds of evaluations of like I, you know, my perspective of science has changed completely. Now I doubt everything. Now I look at, at everything with a question mark. I don't want to destroy people's faith in science, but I feel like for us to be credible, we have to show that we are, are, are able of reassessing where we are. The nice thing about science to differentiate this from all sorts of other things is that we reflect, we reassess, we try to improve. And the course doesn't just criticize, it doesn't just ask us to reevaluate, but it also gives tools in order to do and improve together with, with the students, together with the community. So what is it that we, we, we've done? Uh, we've done replications and extensions, we've done uh, science assessments, and we've done community resources. And for each one of these components, there's a place where you can come in and contribute. You can join us. You can be our collaborator, co-author, our peer reviewer, whatever it is that you feel comfortable with, whatever it is that you want to contribute or learn, you're very welcome to take part in any one of these. I'm going to start first from the, um, you know, the, what I've been doing with my, with my students 
with the replication part, replications and extensions. And first I wanna say why replications? Uh, I think um, do, doing my PhD in the management department, I don't think replications have even been mentioned. I remember two or three years ago in a job talk that I attended at HKUSD, uh, somebody came for a job talk and talked about doing uh, you know, study one and then study two replication with a twist and then another replication with a twist. And I remember some of the faculty sitting in the after uh, discussion saying, the replication is not going to be accepted for a journal, therefore don't do this. It's not, it's not good for, uh, for career. And, and this was true up to uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, also in uh, psychology. So I wanna say why this, is, why this is important and why this is especially uh, good for you as early career researchers and for students, also undergrads, undergraduates to, to do. So for me, this is very practical. You can do a high quality replication, a simple one, not a very complicated one in a single semester. It's very straightforward, um, run short experiments in judgment decision-making. A lot of this is, is vignettes that you manipulate one factor or another in a very simple uh, dependent uh, variable uh, measure that is usually one item or a couple of items that uh, measure different dependent variables. It's very measurable because you have the original and you need to replicate this as best you can. So whatever the replication is, you just compare this to the original. So did they do a good job at analyzing the original and trying to reproduce, uh, do exactly the same thing uh, again? Plus, we do not only replications, we do replications and extensions. So extensions, we have very specific ways of adding things. So now you can differentiate between what did the original do? So that's like a building block. So first we verify this, and then we do extensions to go beyond that. So let's say you did only novel uh, something. You've spent four years of your PhD working on something. You ran data collections, very big. You went to uh, organizations, uh, you collected your data, you analyze this, and then you have no findings. First of all, you can't publish these no findings in a management journal right now. Uh, but let's say that there is now increasing uh, need for uh, publishing or the willing to publish uh, these kinds of novel findings. The question is, what have we learned? Because it's novel, how do you know what, what went wrong? If you do a replication and extension, you can have a look. Is it that the replication failed? Is it that the extension failed? If the replication worked and the extension failed, you can say, first of all, I've added to the knowledge in that saying that the original replicated and my extension, my novel part is what failed. If everything is novel, how do we know where we went wrong? So. A lot of it is a lot more measurable. It's also much more systematic. It reduces the uncertainty and it's a very clear process that now we have a lot of Google, uh, Google uh, docs in order for you to go step-by-step. Step. What does it mean to do a replication? How to design an extension? Whatever you find is valuable because if you do a replication and you failed to find support for the original findings, you can have a look and see what is it that failed? What could be the reasons? It could be that the first published work was a false positive. So perhaps we need to revisit everything, but it could be that we've learned something new. Maybe it's the context, maybe it's no longer relevant because you know time has passed. Maybe the materials need to be uh, updated. Everything that you do in a replication is valuable. And if the replication worked and you did an extension, then you can learn from it because you know exactly what it is that you've added and where, where things go, went wrong. And then you can try your extension again, or you can take this into different directions. It's very instructive. I think people learn a lot from that about what the scientific process actually is. This is our team. Yeah, I think it's, it's unbelievable that we, we are at this uh, scale after three years. Uh, two years ago, I decided I'm no longer do, going to do this, just me by myself with my students. So I had all these 300 students that came through my courses. I decided I'm going to invite others. others. And the first ones that I invited and, and joined me were Prasad uh, from uh, HKUST, Jane, uh, who, who was very kind. And now we, we did a few projects together, John. That you know, doing his PhD very hectic. I know they had all sorts of other uh, pressures to do other things. Decided to to join on this. So um, the first ones that came in came from uh, HKUST and here in Hong Kong. But after a few conferences that I attended, and after we've had a few initial successes, people started joining in. in and it's really nice to see how big this is. And the remarkable thing is that all of these are early career researchers. 
All of these are starting from PhD, like John. Uh, you know, uh, so some of them are now masters. So some of these lead authors are now we're, we're working with masters, uh, and the MPhil students that are, are working with me here at HQ, all the way to you know beginner assistant professor, first, second, third year, just like me. So it's a very uh, early career, young, passionate, enthusiastic uh, team. We also have peer reviewers that come in and help us. So every step of the way, I go on Twitter. And I say, uh, this is what my, uh, you know, my team did, the students did. Uh, who is willing to help us improve this? And everything is Google Docs, everything is open, everything is uh, collaborative. So suddenly we get even original authors coming in, looking over the Google Docs and giving us comments, helping us improve. So we've got external uh, peer reviewers. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, judgment and decision making, but Daniel over here. Is, is a famous name from uh, uh, Linkoping in, in Sweden. And then I visited them and now they have their own uh, JDM mass replication uh, project, which is, which is remarkable. So overall, this is a very impressive group of people. At the beginning, everything went through me, but now they're working with each other. They're helping one another uh, and they're doing remarkable things uh, with no, no senior scholars. All of this is students and early career researchers working with, with one another and, and publishing. Not only this, uh, but there's lots of resources and all of these resources are collaborative. You can come in, use this as you wish. If you see something you want to contribute, you contribute, you add your name, you say what it is that you contributed. And when we submit this to the journals and we submit this uh, you know, every once in a while, we submit something to the journal, you're going to be a co-author. So go in, help, contribute. It's going to be a big, a big group of people, early career researchers uh, contributing to these templates and guides. Uh, but at the end, it's going to be a very high quality guide. If I would do this on my own, if it's just me telling my students, this is how you do an extensions. First of all, it's going to have a lot of uh, problems because I'm not perfect. Yeah, I'm yeah, human. Good question. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm really very impressed with the, uh, this collaborative approach you have done. Uh, I guess this is more learning from you. I, I actually, I, I sometimes I really find I'm at the uh, at the limit of my capacity to to you know uh, to manage the project and working with a lot of people. So I'm just curious, how do you actually manage this uh, large number of projects and involving I don't know how many. I mean, at least double digit, right? Maybe it's uh, yeah. three digit number of collaborators. How how do you exactly you manage this whole process? Do you sleep? Uh, uh, five hours each day, four hours each day, and how exactly you manage them? Um, so great, I'm going to address this in the upcoming slides. Uh, I'm gonna display the, the process, uh, but briefly uh, I'm gonna say that this is the power of open science and collaboration. Because everything is open, because there are checks and balances in every step, because there's open peer review, because there's peer review from different groups, the model that we have is that there's so many checks and balances, there's so many places along the, the, um, the process where we can find errors. There's actually, uh, if there's something that went wrong over there, uh, we can catch it. And most of this is self-managed. So the team manages itself. You can ask, how does Wikipedia work? Is there somebody that manages and doesn't sleep and only have five hours a night in order to manage the entire millions of things in Wikipedia? No, it's the power of collaboration. So you set, you set the rules, you set the process, you say what the, you know, the editorial process is for all of these things. How do people peer review each other? How do you uh, manage each one of these changes? And finally, you get Wikipedia. Finally, you get something collaborative that is of very high quality. It's not perfect. It's very high quality, it's transparent, and it leads to very high impact with a lot of, uh, of outputs. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, this, is, this is what the team has been able to do in 2020. So you can see uh, we've had uh, 12 of these uh, come out. And these are not even, this, this is just the replications uh, without all the, the, the guides, the, the templates, and all the other stuff that, that came out as, as preprints. And, and what you can see here is that our model is that uh, what we have is all the students are underlined, followed by the teaching assistants. And this could be you, the first author could be you. So you might be familiar with some of the names here. So this is Prasad over here as the first author. This is John here as the first author. This is Yang as the first author, followed by the students with this shared first co-author in a note. And then finally me trailing uh, at the end. 
uh, uh, working together. So we all try and, and verify one another. We all try and, and help each other. First, the students do, together with me and the TAs, we finish these replication projects. And then we invite people like Prasad, Jane, John, to come in and work with us to take the lead on something that has been completed already but to verify these, to make sure that they're decent. If you want, you add additional analysis. If you want, you add another uh, study, but you take this all the way with submission to the end. So we invite, we open everything up. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you just how many of these we have. So these are the 12 that got published. We also had some preprints uh, that are now in uh, under review in all sorts of uh, places. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Jane's uh, current uh, revise and resubmit. Uh, later on as a case study, uh, but there's all, all of these things uh, going on. And then, you know, 2021, even during pandemic, uh, everybody is under stress and pressure. The group keeps coming out with uh, preprints and working very well together. And this is the power of collaboration. I think it's really inspiring to see how this uh, group works. They support one another. If somebody is a bit more busy than somebody else takes, um, you know, takes the lead, uh, really bringing together and the, the power the power of community uh, so really inspiring to me to see how everybody uh, works and th this is an open invitation for you to come and join us so you can take some of our students we have a lot of completed projects if you want to do some of this you can come in i can share everything with you you can have a look and decide if this is uh, high enough quality uh, for you if you uh, support this, if this uh, speaks to you. And then you can be uh, the lead author, just like I, I showed here, um, followed by the students, the teaching assistants and myself um, to take over these uh, these projects. How many did we do? Uh, by the end of this year, we're gonna have a hundred of these. So we've completed the 72 of, of these pre-registered replications and extensions. Uh, we run those on Amazon Mechanical Turk in the US or British Prolific with uh, British participants. And we ran a few in, in Hong Kong here at HKU uh, when that was uh, still a possibility. And uh, it didn't cost us very much because all of this is uh, online labor markets. And I understand of course that this is very specific to judgment decision-making and there's more acceptance of MTurk and Prolific in, in psychology, social psychology. But I think at the very least it could help you revisit some of the things that you're doing in management in terms of stimuli, do all the pretests that you need before you go into the field, before you actually take the next step, or simply revisit some of the uh, easier behavioral lab experiments, just like the one I, saw, I showed you with the, the, the leadership easily done on Amazon Mechanical Turk if you wanna uh, run this. And I want you to consider this number over here. Uh, it's it's uh, our success rate. If you remember social psychology, somewhere between 30 to 50%, uh, in the judgment decision making, in the classics, this is not random samplings, this is uh, classics in the field of judgment decision making that I chose based on impact number of citations and all this. Our replication rate is 70%. Uh, we have some mixed and inconclusive and we have some unsuccessful. Even in the mixed and the inconclusives, we were able to identify all sorts of issues. And mixed and inconclusive say that maybe one DV work and one DV didn't work, you know, one study work, one hypothesis work and one didn't work. So we need to go deeper into it and we need to uh, see what the next study should be. But already some very interesting insights over here. But even with the unsuccessful, the, the failed replications, there's a lot that we can then we can learn from this. We can inform ourselves in order to do better. Uh, because these have a lot of citations, we need to understand how could it be that you know follow-up studies have found something while the replication did not. Perhaps we need to update the materials. Perhaps it's no longer relevant. It was relevant uh, 20, 30 years ago. It's not relevant now, but we can update our knowledge. Beyond that, beyond the impressive 70% uh, for judgment decision-making, I really want you to consider what this number means. Because at the beginning, when I wanted to do this, the first year when I came to HQ and said, I'm going to run this project, I'm going to do replications with undergraduate second year to fourth year here at HKU, uh, online MTurk prolific. A lot of people did not believe that this is going to work out. They set us up to fail or, you know, we're very pessimistic about our chances. Beyond the judgment decision making literature, consider that 
these undergraduates were able to visit, revisit all these studies and do such good work that they were able to replicate a lot of the classics or find important insights on why things did not replicate. So really ex extraordinary work by these students. Uh, we also completed uh, register reports. Uh, our, if you are not familiar with register reports, this is the future of science, of conformatory science. And I really feel like you need to look into this uh, deeper. I gave a workshop here at HKU uh, two months ago. I can't remember how long ago. And you can watch this. It's about two and a half hours on YouTube. What is a register reports? Why do we want to do register reports? What is this uh, new model? It's not pre-registration. It's taking pre-registration one step further. Uh, and we have these two models. On one side, we do pre-registered replications and extensions. And on the other side, we do replications and extensions registered report stage one. Um, so we have all both, both of these uh, streams. I'm gonna give you some uh, examples of what we did. Each semester is a little bit uh, different. This is autumn 2019. We, do 11, we did 11 replications. Each replication is just, just a re replication, but we crowdsource this. We have two groups of two students working independently. They do not communicate with one another. They look at the original article separately and they analyze this. They do the replication best that they can in order to you know, set up the survey, do the data analysis on the random data set, and then they peer review each other. Then they design different types of extensions. And we run each one of these groups on a different uh, target sample. So for each one of replications, you can see 72 replications, but it's more than that because every replication includes more than one sample in order to make this uh, rigorous so that we can compare the two groups. We can compare first the replication in different samples. One is American, one is British, and then we can compare their extensions. So maybe this one worked, this one didn't work, but then we can combine all of this into a single manuscript into a, you know, an interesting uh, insights. Uh, this is what our model works. So this is how we are able to uh, do this collaboratively. There is a, a stage here where I don't sleep a lot, but it doesn't, it's not very long. So it starts from a Qualtrics experiment. So they analyze the original study, they uh, build a, a Qualtrics. From the Qualtrics, there is a, a feature that allows you to export uh, simulated data sets. They do this, they write up the pre-registration, then they peer review each other. I go on Twitter and said, the students did this replication, who wants to help? We get external peer review. Then they have one week to revise this. Then I have two, three weeks where I go and I pre-register everything after I verify that everything is okay. I collect the data for that on Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific based on my uh, seed funding or funding that I was able to, to get. I give them the data sets, they analyze this differently, then they peer review each other, they write up the results. I uh, ask Twitter and the community to come in and help us verify this. And finally, here we have final reports. These final reports are manuscripts that are, uh, should be ready for submission, but we don't submit this, them yet. We invite you, uh, early career researchers, to come in take the lead over these completed manuscripts, verify everything, add your own analysis, make sure that the introduction and the discussion are humble, fair, and scientific. And then you help us submit this to the journals um, um, to, to do well on that. If you wanna see the uh, how well they did, I really recommend that you go on this link. Uh, I think the students did extraordinary work. And I can say without any hesitation, what these students do, uh, are is much higher quality than anything that I have done in my PhD. Uh, it's it's that good, and it's following best practices in in psychological science. Uh, so it's a humbling experience working with these students and seeing what they're capable of. Please go and have a look at these. And if there's a project there that you're interested in, let me know, and you, maybe you can take uh, the lead if it's if it's open. And nobody else took took over this. Register reports, uh, we have similar model, just so we understand what register reports are. You write a pre-registration and the pre-registration is submitted to the journal. So uh, you take the pre-registration, you submit it to the journal, then it goes through peer review. There is no data collected, nothing has been done yet. The peer reviewers give you constructive, positive feedback on how to improve. And once you agree together with the editor and the peer reviewers that this is the best way, the best science, to do for this research question and this hypothesis, the uh, journal gives you in principle acceptance. It means that it doesn't matter 
p-value lower than 0.05, yes, no, whatever the findings are, if you follow the pre-registration or explained why you deviated, then you're granted a, a publication in the journal. So you focus on science. You don't try and find you know, the support for your hypothesis. You just run it the way that you and the peer reviewers and the editor agreed to run this. And I think the model that we should follow is that the best evidence is register reports up here above all the others. The status quo research is almost you know, barely worth a mention because we haven't verified any of this. But when we have open science, we increase credibility, register reports are the best that we have. And hopefully in a decade, we'll have meta-analyses of register reports that will have credible uh, research. Uh, some of the vaccine work, some of the stuff that's been done with COVID follows uh, register reports. Uh, in medical practices, this has been, uh, I think, for the last uh, decade or, or two. So you have to go on a public website and say what it is that you, you do, and you need an oversight from an external committee and all that. So at least some of the uh, vaccines that are out there follow this very rigorously. This is the, the process. And once again, I invite you to go over this. If you prefer Register report stage one, please go have a look, tell, tell me which one you want to take over. So you can choose. All of this is open to you. All of this is collaborative. Please come join us. If you don't want to be a co-author, let's say that you don't feel that you're ready for this, uh, we would love to have you as a peer reviewer. As a peer reviewer, you get to learn a lot. You get to interact with other students, other, other early career researchers to see the scientific process and what it means to be 100% uh, 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 open about each and every step of the of the way. This brings me to uh, this uh, publication. Uh, I, I also let Jane, hopefully, if she wants to talk a little bit about uh, things from her perspective uh, afterwards. I'm just going to say that you can see she is the lead author over here, followed by our, our students, uh, teaching assistant, and then fin uh, finally me. She took two projects. Uh, combine them together, uh, study one, uh, rigorous, uh, large sample, um, and then study two of a different study, but both of them looked at hindsight bias. And the nice thing about hindsight bias, I don't know if you're familiar, if Elik, uh, if you went through the course with Elik about what hindsight bias is, but I think it really, it's a reflection of all the problems that we have in the, in the, in the literature. So um, sometimes when we see the results, it uh, changes, it biases our perspective of what we thought is going to happen to begin with. So sometimes we see the outcome and say, of course, this is the outcome. This is not surprising. I knew this all along, therefore this is not valuable. But if you blind people to the outcome, suddenly they're not really sure, is it this way, is it that way? So I really like this. Uh, Jane did a, a remarkable work over here where she uh, took the, the work by, by the students and summarized everything. And we have a way of summarizing replications. Um, you know, she did all these uh, very nice plots. Uh, some things are stronger than others. So we have all sorts of events, all sorts of outcomes, but generally the pattern that you can see is very strong support for hindsight bias. I think this is one of our strongest uh, judgment decision-making uh, directions. Um, but, but finally, I really, really like it. But Jane added a, a third study. And a third study is that she showed that people have hindsight bias about the replicability of hindsight bias. So we asked people, is hindsight bias going to replicate or not? And to some of them, we show the results, positive or negative. And to some of them, we blinded the results. And we can see that people changed their evaluation of the replicability of hindsight bias. Um, after they saw the results. So hindsight bias over hindsight bias, wonderful, wonderful study and extension, uh, very nice. So Jenny not only took what the students did, but she also had added her own flavor to this and some really interesting insights uh, for the open science community and what it means for the scientific process. So wonderful stuff over there. If you wanna see Jenny uh, uh, talk a little, well, it's not a video, it's written. So we also invite the early career researchers to write on psychology today. So Janine uh, wrote this uh, article. And then I, had, uh, I have Rihanna over here who also got her uh, thesis uh, published. So um, if you also feel like you want to contemplate about open science and, and you know, write for psychology today, you're very welcome to. If you wanna see a testimonial of what it means to join us as an early career, uh, this is uh, Adrian and, and he did, he does a lot of stuff with us and he's a very valuable member of our team. So this is actually a video uh, 
four minutes, I think, and you can go and listen to Edu and to see how things work. So this is the replication part, a lot of opportunities over there, but we also have meta science, science assessments. So uh, the students, before actually they do replications, they visit published findings. It could be published findings in the literature uh, or our publications. So we revisit, we revisit others and we revisit ourselves and they assess everything. So we have a template how to assess the rigorousness, uh, rigorousness of, of the rigor of, uh, of science publication, uh, how to assess a pre-registration, how to assess a publication in light of a pre-registration. Um, so um, it's, it's, again, everything is open. You're very welcome to have a look at this and see how we do assessments. This is the direction where I'm headed uh, towards. Uh, so I'm gonna slowly uh, leave replications behind, hopefully move beyond those in order to do more meta science to see how we can improve our science and give people best practices, tools, uh, and things in order to do uh, assessments of the research and, and, and look at credibility. Lots of hidden slides. I'm gonna skip uh, through that. If you want, you can download all the slides over here and look at the hidden slides as well. Lots of links to all sorts of resources, very recommended. Finally, community resources. So we write a lot of templates, guides, books, opinion pieces, and all of this is open for you to collaborate on. This is, I think, the most remarkable example. The students, uh, undergraduate, second year, wrote a book, 200 pages book on a Google Doc, uh, that now we have a preprint for this, of what is the open science movement? What is the credibility revolution? Uh, so separated this into different chapters, six students per chapter, the teaching assistants help, people come from Twitter, and then together, finally, we, um, we, we arrived at this. It's not perfect, we still need to work at it, but at least now there's a documentation of uh, the open science movement and this credibility revolution, if you wanna read about this. All the other projects, uh, open science primers and guides, just look at what the students did. They also have video presentations, so you can see uh, they're, very, they're, they're, they're very eloquent and clear. About their, about their outputs, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, bring some of those to, um, to publications. So this is a kind of a very short version of a very long story. Uh, again, you can go on YouTube and, and, and take uh, longer to really revisit all the links and, and look at each one of the templates and uh, look at some examples. I strongly encourage you to do that, especially uh, look at Jiangin's uh, work. She, you know, we published two together. One is in process. Look at John work, uh, John's work. Uh, ter terrific stuff. I think John presented this at uh, HKUSD at some point. So really look at these things and, and look at the supplementary. Look at the open science materials. Look at the entire process. And I hope that you can find some inspiration in that. And then you can talk to John, to Jiangin, to Prasad, to me, if you want to know more about any of these projects or what it means. These are my takeaways the last uh, few minutes. Um, and I, I, want you, I want you to just imagine. So all of this that I showed you, this is one lab, very you know, small lab. I don't even have like, students, PhD students. I don't really have a lab. The two Enfield students that I was not able to fund that wanted to work with me. So they're, they're here, but you know, out of their own uh, free will, uh, join me. But really there's, there's like, it's just, uh, us organizing things together and somehow it became this, this community, this uh, collaboration. Can you imagine what would happen if uh, Elik would do this, if Melody would do this, if Yafing would do this, if Jane would do this in, in Canada, if John would do this you know, wherever he's gonna be, if Rasad is gonna do this wherever he's gonna be. So just imagine uh, all these labs, all these communities rising and working together, students and early career researchers uh, feeling empowered, feeling that they're capable, feeling that they can publish, that they can do good, rigorous, trustworthy, open science uh, work. They, uh, the power of collaboration. We can do our own Wikipedia of uh, trustworthy scientific findings of whatever literature this is. You can do this in judgment, decision-making, social psychology, management, and beyond. Even as a practitioner, I don't know where you're gonna go next or what it is that you're, you plan to do, but the power of community joining in this, telling us, you know, what it is that you need, what your insights are, how we can help you, how you can help us. Uh, working as a community is, is very powerful. Um, I also want you to, to really take away from this that you can drive change. I think Elik knows very well that my road 
my journey has been bumpy, just like he said. Moving from management to psychology is not easy. Uh, lots of things along the way, deciding that you're an open science scholar and you know, saying all sorts of things about this, the status of science. It has, it has a price. It, not everything is, is easy and straightforward, but early career researchers, more and more we see these um, you know, examples in the open science community of students uh, and young scholars who are really making a change. We shouldn't wait. We shouldn't wait for the senior scholars to make this change. We should do this change. We should inform senior scholars about what's happening. Don't wait for your, you know, the you know, Yapping or Elik or Melody to tell you, let's do a register report. You come and you ask them for a register report. You ask them to do open, um, open data, open code, sharing everything. You ask them to have open peer review where you have an open Google doc. You drive the change. You get a community. You work with other students. You are empowered. You can do amazing things without the senior scholars. And you can publish also without them. Uh, you can, of course, do this with them, but you don't have to wait for them. You don't need just them in order to do uh, these kinds of things. You have the capacity to lead. There's so many opportunities. You don't even have to do this uh, with us. You can take everything that we've done. Everything is open. Do this on your own. Take this, uh, work with other students in MGMT, work with other students around the world. Lots of opportunities. Uh, you can make a real change in science. Uh, in, in a decade, things are going to look very different. If you're looking at the job market in four years, five years, I promise you, things are going to be different. Credibility, trustworthiness are going to be the key. We already last year had the Hong Kong principles of open science where we're changing the assessment of what scholars are going to be, be evaluated about. It's not going to be impact factors anymore and, and all these you know, big, uh, big shot reputation. It's going to be about credibility. How reliable is your science? And you don't want to end up you know, after 20 years regretting to have published something that uh, later was were found to be, to be not credible. So you really have an opportunity here early on in your career. I wish that I was right now in my MPhil or my PhD being able to join this kind of thing. You can start early and you know once you get to the job market, this is going to already be a fact and you're gonna have a, a, real, a real advantage in that. If you wanna join us, uh, lots of opportunities. Uh, lots of it is summarized on this link over here. Uh, you can take lead over replications. You can take lead over register reports. You can collaborate with us on all sorts of primers, guides, opinion pieces. You can work with us on our templates, on our manuals. You can also su suggest all sorts of other directions. So for example, we um, somebody came in and said, can we do prediction markets? And we did prediction markets. And now it's, it's this wonderful collaboration. Prasad is part of that as well. So, so that's really nice. Just let me know what it is that you'd like to do. Even if you don't wanna do this uh, in our team, I can suggest other links. By now we have a lot of people that I can connect you with. Just let me know what works for you. Finally, everything that I told you about uh, is openly shared uh, on my website. So this is the main link. Please go and have a look. This is my uh, website. I'm very active on Twitter. So if you want to communicate with me on Twitter, just, not just me, but also the open science community is very active over there. We have a mailing list where we um, you know, share things about um, you know, the upcoming workshops and, and seminars and everything. Um, that we're doing. And finally, if you have any questions, specific things that you want to talk to me about, this is my email. I'm very happy to hear from you and try to help you do better in your career in your open science journey. Just let me know what it is that I can do to help. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a question about the replication studies. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I believe your replication studies could be very valuable for the credibility evaluation, but is it possible to combine some results from the replicated studies to come up with some new theoretical frameworks or models. I suppose most theoretical contributions in replicated studies may be not so new and so creative. So I'm curious how to make the new theoretical contributions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so lots of things to say about that. Uh, first of all, um, uh, we, we would need to have a discussion why is theoretical contribution so important and what you mean by theoretical contribution. My issue with theoretical contribution is that it seems to be a very subjective thing. 
up until you know I've had five years of a, a PhD in management, I'm still not sure what a theoretical contribution is. You talk to the five different people, you get five different opinions uh, on that. And whenever you submit something to a journal, let's say you have five reviewers, you, you, very often two are to say, yeah, amazing contribution, two are to say there's nothing here. So I just, to me, the whole concept of a theoretical contribution is very, uh, very difficult and challenging to, to define. Plus, I don't think we've been doing theory. My understanding of theory is that we have not been doing theory uh, the right way. Theories need to be falsifiable. They need to be stated very, very clearly. Uh, they need to be as close as possible you know, to what science is. It's not storytelling. It's not everything falls into a theory. You need to uh, define in advance for a theory what would falsify this, uh, this theory. So even when it comes to theory, I believe we have an, uh, an emerging crisis of a theory crisis where we need to revisit our theories in order to make sure that they're really scientific, that they're really falsifiable. When you say a theory, what are your hypotheses and how are you going to test these? And then make sure that your methods are aligned with your theories. My general approach to this is, um, you know, empirical um, evidence-based uh, theories. So we come from a phenomena, we have an accumulation, Perhaps we did a systematic review or meta-analysis. And from that, we can come up, you know, we can have a look at an entire uh, field. And from that, we can inform something and come up with uh, some theories. But just me sitting down in a room, uh, writing an AMR uh, that, you know, mostly nobody will ever test. It's to me that that's not, that's not a theory. Now, regarding novelty and contribution, there's all sorts of ways to do this with our replication. And that's why we do replications uh, and extensions. So not only do we re replicate, but we also add step-by-step, step. you know, we build on foundations. So uh, first we make sure that what we know is solid. Once we've verified that, we take a little step, not, you know, big leap forward. And then, you know, if, if that doesn't work, everything crumbles, but it's like, uh, now, you know, every step is reliable. So you build this little bit and after a while you have an accumulation of a literature that is, um, that, that is reliable, that is based on, on solid foundations. And, and from that, you'll, you'll see that all these extensions, you know, added, added something in a, in a direction of a theory. So hopefully your extensions are informed by the literature. They're informed by, by uh, the theoretical uh, arguments, but they're testable so that you'll know if I do this extension, this is in support of this theory. And it, it's not in support of that theory. Sometimes a really good extension is kind of uh, finding a way where these are competing theories, uh, competing hypothesis, and then you can see which one of them uh, finds support. And after that, you can accumulate these findings and, and arrive at some, some, some predictions. But in general, I want to urge you to move to a model that emphasizes empirics of, over uh, theory. And if you uh, do theory, that it's informed somehow uh, by, by the data and doesn't just like come out, come out of nowhere. However, this is a, a, an obsession and a fascination that management has with uh, theory. And it really has to change, especially in places like AMJ, uh, some of the top journals. So this is a journey that, that uh, management field still needs to go through. And we need to rethink what we know about theory and how to do theory better. That, that's my humble view. I'm sure that your own uh, professors have some other takes on this. So my, my, my guess is that it's very likely that there's more clear division of labor. That is, I think theory cannot be standing alone without empirical support. So it has to be relying on the, on, on, on the very reliable and credible empirical support in such a sense. So I, my, this is my, my, my guess, probably in, in, in management. So the, the, the change that people would de-emphasize uh, the importance of theory will, 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 will not likely happen. But on the other hand, would much strongly emphasize on the credibility of the empirical data and empirical support of the theories or whatever kind. So my, I'm, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking very likely there is a more likely to have a division of, of the labor. So, so initially you can see in, 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 in academy of management, there's a new journal, journal relatively new, not, 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 not that new now, this uh, a, AMD. So I think it's moving towards into uh, that direction, although not so structurally or very formally yet.
yeah. So this is my my guess. Could be wrong. I could be correct. It comes in less than a few years later. Yes. Thank you for, for your advice. I agree that um, the top journals of management maybe pay too much attention to theoretical contributions. But uh, is it the possible reason that uh, more replic replicated studies published in psychological journals instead of the management journals? And uh, when do you think the management journals can accept this chance of replication, replicated studies in the future? Yeah, it's a good, good question. I think some changes are already happening. So some editors, you know, like the Leadership Quarterly, I think was one of the first editors, but now we have all kinds of journals, including MOR, which is the more, uh, let's say, regional management journal that are accepting register reports. Uh, and that's a big step for management journals. Uh, not a lot of management journals accept register reports. Journal of Business and Psychology uh, and uh, a few others are not accepting register reports. So that's a direction that you uh, can, go, can go for. If you know of a classic study that you want to uh, replicate and you feel that this is important, you can do a replication and extension. You can talk to some of the more supportive, uh, open science supportive editors in MOR, in uh, JBP, in these kinds of journals that are endorsing this kind of thing. And hopefully they'll be able to, to en endorse that. Plus, uh, I think many of the, not many, but some of the, uh, psychology journals uh, are accepted as uh, top journals in management. Uh, so you have a few people in your faculty right now. Uh, I think first when, when Melody came in, you know, she had JPSPs and psychological science and everybody was like, how is this related to management? Now I think, uh, you know, business schools, especially top business schools, have people with JPSP, psychological science, all these other uh, journals, JSP, I think also John can maybe say something, I don't know, JSP is also considered a, a good venue. So you can at the very least uh, aim for these journals that are considered by management departments to uh, submit your replications or register reports to those. So there's a lot that you can do in that. I think JPSP Psychological Science is definitely a, a one, you know, tier A, uh, journal in, in those. So it can even help you uh, in your career. So it's not like if I don't have any venues in uh, management, therefore I'm stuck and there are no options. First of all, there are some options. Second of all, you can go to a different domain that is respected by, by management and try a little bit uh, of that. You can also, through your professor, uh, contact some of the editors and see if there's interest. Perhaps they're willing, they understand the changes in the field perhaps they're willing to do all sorts of things. We, you know, I'm not, from, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in uh, Nanyang Technological University, I've collaborated with uh, Krishna Savani, uh, who, is, who is well known, so he's in a business school. And we together, so he's an editor in JPSP, and we, there's a new incoming uh, editor in JPSP PPID. So that's a different section of JPSP. It's almost like a different a journal and we ask would JPSP be willing to consider registered reports for one of the meta-analyses that we're doing so it's it's an ongoing journey it's not always a yes you know you need to kind of like find your way but the more you do of this the more people uh, know of you the the more possible this will be I'm, I'm just going to wrap up with an example when I started this in 2017 uh, there were very few replications uh, published so the students, the master students that did the replications with me, they asked me, is anybody going to be interested in this? And I said, I, I really don't know. How about you go on ResearchGate and you tell the community that we're going to do replications. And my three students went on ResearchGate and wrote, we are going to do a pre-register replication and extension of X. Suddenly, a month later, they got a comment on ResearchGate by, <laughs> by Sander, Sander Cole. Uh, from Amsterdam, who wrote to them, I'm the incoming editor of Cognition and Emotion. Would you consider submitting to my journal? <laughs> so I asked him, it's like, uh, what's, what's going on? He says, yeah, nobody's submitting re replications and we really want replications. It seems like you're doing replications. Maybe you submit this to, uh, to us. So my students were very, very excited about this. I said, oh my God, you know, we're going to get a publication. I said, wait, hold on. There's a whole, whole process from you know, an invitation to an acceptance. There's a long journey, but a year and a half later, 
uh, a master's student in Maastricht University had a publication, two publications in cognition and emotion. So they were looking for people who are doing replication. So you can be one of the first in your field to show and say that you're doing this kind of thing. If people know that you're doing this, maybe they'll reach out to you. Maybe there's a way of making this happen. So can never know. Yeah. Hi, hi, I'm Sherry, a first year PhD student in MGMT. And um, uh, here I have a little confusion about, uh, I like the idea about open science and replication. And um, I, I'm wondering how the is difference between like, for example, sometimes we see a paper say, uh, they started the same topic with uh, some other authors, but they have some new findings. Like they, they would say, uh, they, they find this result, but we find that uh, actually it's not that the case. And so their finding becomes the, uh, like the very groundbreaking or very innovative findings. And, uh, but they don't see like the, the previous findings is not replicated. I think it, it's, it feels like, like it's two ways of, um, I guess it's like the two problem maybe, uh, but I'm just a little bit confused about this distinction. Sorry, so just so I understand the distinction between what two things? Yeah, like uh, for example, the one previous study said like the more income we have, we'll be happier, but there is a plateau for like $75,000 maybe. And later there's new finding uh, find that there is no plateau in that uh, uh, after that income actually people have will be happier when they have more money and the, and then the later study become a groundbreaking one and but they don't say like the previous study is not replicated they just uh, yeah, you know find the uh, have this new finding so I'm thinking about the, the, the problem of like some studies can't be replicated. And uh, the, 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 here's one issue about these things can't be replicated. And another issue is like we find new things uh, constantly and those new findings are regarded as like um, some good things to be published. Yeah, okay, I, I think I understand, but you can correct me if I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, I yeah, think sure. gener generally, um, science really is messy and it's a journey and we need to understand how we assess evidence. So let's say we have evidence uh, going in this direction and then somebody comes and says the evidence goes in that direction. Sometimes it's you know, positive direction, some is it's negative direction, some, some people come and say, but we didn't find any direction, so we didn't find support for positive or negative. And then you look at all of this together and you're trying to uh, make an assessment of how, what, what to do with this kind of, of thing. So we are very worried about uh, these kinds of stuff. So let's take uh, extreme um, you know, implications for medicine, you know, vaccines, for all sorts of that. We really want to be able to assess things rigorously, rigorously. So first of all, we can assess things in terms of how well did they do on things that relate to rigor? You know, so are the measures precise? Is it a well-powered sample? You know, is, is, is everything rigorous? Is our pre-registration? All the, all the things that we know that we need to assess in a scientific uh, paper. And then hopefully we have a few people who do independent uh, replications. So let's say we have uh, trials, so we have uh, trial phase one, trial phase two, trial phase three, and we have different places in the world that try uh, the, different, uh, the different things, increasing the, uh, the sample size all the time and informing, giving us more and more evidence about whether something uh, is working or not and in what, and in what direction. Um, so at the end, we need to uh, decide what is our criteria for success? How do we evaluate this? It's very important that we set up this criteria well in advance so that we don't fool ourselves. So once we already see the outcome, then we decide how we want to proceed. We need to decide in advance. So what is our uh, measure for success? What does it mean that we have a phenomenon? What does it mean that we found support for a theory? 
And then we try to aggregate all the things together. So perhaps you ran 100 uh, participants, I ran uh, you know, 80, John ran 200, and then together we aggregate this in the best methods that we have in order to try and assess whether the uh, accumulated uh, evidence is in support of that or not. There are many techniques of doing that. Systematic review is a way of looking at the literature and trying to make sense of it um, in a more narrative sort of way. But meta-analysis allows you to quantify uh, evidence and also look at all sorts of things like, is there a publication bias? Are there some other issues uh, with evidence? It enables you to find moderators. So perhaps the moderator is culture. Perhaps it's the language of the survey. Perhaps it has to do with all sorts of things. And then once you've identified this, you can also follow up with this with another, you know, it could be an adversarial collaboration where the two teams that found opposite findings come together and they say the best test of this theory, of this uh, phenomena is that, and then they pre-register, they will do a re register report, and then together they try to arrive at, uh, at the conclusion and the, at, you know, some kind of resolution to this. So this is how science uh, works. So it's very iterative, you know, it's like step by step, you build up uh, your foundations. And at the end, you look at a body of work, you look at a body of evidence, and then you try to, to arrive at some conclusion. No, no one study, it doesn't matter how rigorous is, is, uh, is enough for this. Even if you have a very large data set, it came from a certain place with a certain bias. So you need as many as, many of those as possible. Now it's possible for you to do this. Uh, so let's say you want to do a really good PhD thesis on a topic, whatever the topic is, and you want to have a lot of different replications from different people, but you don't have resources, you're only a PhD student, and you're really worried because you want to have a solid phenomena. So how to do this? Um, now there are options because of the power of collaboration, because of the power of community. Now we have all sorts of ways for you to do this. So for example, early career researchers started something called Psychological Science Accelerator. So you can um, submit a proposal saying, this is my proposal. And then 40, 70, 100 labs around the world without asking you for money are going to run this over there, but they're all gonna be your uh, collaborators. So together you propose something, people say, oh, this is really interesting. And this, is, this sounds important. Let's do this together. And then together you arrive at the best uh, conclusion. Uh, many other ways of looking at this. If you have a very large data set, there's a way that you can uh, look at this uh, data set. If, uh, you know, if you're well powered enough, you can do something like a multiverse to make sure that you're not uh, biased in a certain direction, that you ran all possible analysis and then come at some conclusion. Uh, there's this really interesting project called the uh, study swap. So for example, if you only want to uh, focus on data collection or you only want to focus on methods or you only want to focus on theory, you go on this swap, study swap and say, this is what I want to do, who wants to uh, join with me. Some people have too many participants so they're looking for somebody with, with ideas, especially you know, if, if you come from Hong Kong and from a good university, then they want to collaborate with you. And finally, all of your uh, collaborators. So. It used to be that we thought, oh my God, I need to do all these replications and I need to do independent, uh, you know, and how to, how to get large samples and how am I going to get something that's solid? Now we know that we can work together as a community. You just need to let people know what you're doing, what it is that you need. And there are options for you, even if you're uh, at the level of a PhD first year uh, student, things are possible for you. So many venues, but at the end we need uh, aggregation of evidence using best methods, in this case, meta-analysis, adversarial collaborations, registered reports, and all that in order to arrive at some uh, conclusion of what is reliable and what is not.